Hi, welcome back. So we're going to continue with our our look at uh, Science 10 here today. And uh, I wanted to take a look at uh, ionic compounds. So it's a continuation on from where we were before. And what is an ionic compound? Well, an ionic compound is when two ions get together and uh, form a compound. So we have uh, a metal and a non-metal getting together, a cation and an anion that are going to get together, and they're going to exchange electrons. And that's what allows them to stay together. So we have a positively charged ion and a negatively charged ion. They're going to get together. Um, the electrons uh, are going to exchange places. I'm going to show this to you. And it's going to create a compound. So just a quick review of how uh, ions are formed. So here we have uh, a Bohr model of calcium. And you can see that we have uh, two on the inner shell, eight on the second shell, eight on the third shell, uh, which then allows us to have two more on the outer shell. So it has a total of 20 electrons. And as I said earlier on, the uh, nature really does not like to have its outermost shell full uh, in an atom. So what it's going to do is it's going to dump these two. It's much easier to dump two in this case than gain uh, six other electrons, try to find six other electrons. So it removes these two, so its outermost shell is filled. Now what that means is we have in its nucleus, it has a total of, sorry, it has a total of 20 protons in its nucleus. But we know that it now has, once it's eliminated these two, so these two electrons are, are gone, so now it has a total of 18 electrons. Well, that gives us a total charge of positive 2. That's how the ion is formed. Calcium forms calcium ion, and the calcium ion has a, has a charge of positive 2. So far to this point, we've taken a look at the periodic table of elements. Now we're going to take a look at the periodic table of ions. The, the exercise that we just went through, uh, understanding how to convert when we look at a Bohr model, how the how many electrons are going to be filled in the outermost shell and how many it's either going to gain or lose in order to form an ion we don't have to do that for each uh, individual element when we look at them uh, there's there is something known as the periodic table of ions and the periodic table that you have in your textbook is a combination of the periodic table of elements and the periodic table of ions and as i said earlier in a periodic table of ions the charge will be put next to each ion. It's either going to be written beside it or on the one in your textbook. It's just written in the upper right hand corner. That shows us the ionic charge. Now uh, we've also taken a look at the makeup or the landscape of the periodic table and a periodic table of ions. Uh, all the elements are still in the same place. All the ions are still in the same place. We have metal ions over on the positive side and we have non-metal ions forming on the uh, right hand side and uh, metal ions typically are positive ions actually they always are and non-metals are going to form negative ions there's also on your chart a, a table of polyatomic ions we'll take a, a, a bigger look at this a little bit later on we're not going to look at it right now but just an understanding of what they are and where they are that'll come a little bit later I did touch on this uh, a little bit earlier in one of my other videos on how um, ions or how ions get together and actually do bond and form a compound. We're going to take a look at it if we have calcium. We've already taken a look at that. We know that calcium has a net charge of positive 2 and uh, we have sulfur. Now when sulfur forms an ion, sulfur has 2 on its inner shell. It has eight on its next shell, and then it has a total of six on the outside shell. So that gives us a total of 16 uh, electrons. But of course, uh, what's easiest for it to do? It's not going to dump these outer six. It's actually looking to gain some. So it can make a, it's a great arrangement that it can make here with calcium. So sulfur, it's going to look to gain two, and it's going to form sulfide. Okay, and here we call this one calcium ion. Only positive or metallic ions are we going to have 
uh, we're going to use this name ion behind when we name them. Uh, negative ions, when they form an ion, we're going to put IDE at the end of them. Okay, so sulfur, we drop the UR and we pick up this IDE here. Now, how does the ionic bonding actually take place? Well, we can see that sulfur, when it forms the ion, it's going to want to put another electron right here, and it's going to want to put another electron right here to fill its outermost shell. Well, what's easiest is if it just transfers and takes these two electrons from calcium. So what we actually end up having is we have calcium sulfide that forms. So these electrons are actually borrowed. Now, sulfide ion has a charge of negative 2. When we write that, we're going to call this CAS, calcium sulfide. I'm going to show you a few more examples uh, in our next slide here. But again, with ionic bonding, we have, and this is important to remember, a transfer of electrons which is going to be different from when we have molecular compounds. So ionic compounds, remember that ions, or sorry, not ions, but electrons are transferred. Okay, They're not shared. Ionic compounds, electrons are transferred. So how do we name these? Uh, naming an ionic compound, very simple. We always put the metallic ion or the cation first, and then we put the anion or the non-metallic ion second, okay? And that's the anion. Okay, so we name this, if we combine calcium and sulfur, or we're going to combine calcium ion and sulfide, we end up with calcium sulfide. We write these as two separate names. And if we write it as a, a word equation, we'll end up with this, calcium ion plus sulfide produces or yields calcium sulfide. If we write it as a chemical equation, we're going to write Ca2 positive, we'll actually write the charge of the ion, plus S2 negative yields, okay, that's what this arrow, it's not equals, but it yields calcium sulfide. And um, later on, we're not going to write the charges. It's good to write the charges early on, but we're not going to write them uh, later on um, because we're going to just leave a space here. Uh, to balance them out. So we'll write them, for now we're going to write them, but we're not going to write them later on, so just get used to that. One of the most difficult things that students have uh, to look at uh, or to keep track of when they are balancing these uh, ionic charges in compounds um, is just that, making sure that we write a subscript carefully. So I'm going to go through a couple of examples here, a number of examples using these ions here. Okay, so we have our cations on this side, positive ions. We have our anions on this side. These are our negative ions, and we're going to combine them. And these can combine in any form, but uh, I'm just going to go through how we balance off the charges for each of them. So let's select a couple of them. Uh, if I have here, we have potassium ion, and we're going to bond that with fluoride. That's going to give us, if I write this as K positive 1, Okay, and I'm going to add that to fluoride negative 1. That's going to yield potassium fluoride. And I'm not going to write anything down at the bottom here, but I'm going to show you another example where we will. So if I take this same potassium, and I'm going to bond this with oxygen. So now I'm going to write potassium positive 1 plus oxygen negative 2. That's going to yield. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, this is a little trick that I like to use. I know it explains it slightly differently in your textbook, but this is a trick that I like to use. I'm just going to change colors here. I'm going to move this 1 down below so it's a subscript of the O of oxygen, and I'm going to move this 2. So now it's I'm going to leave the charge. I'm not going to write the charge. I'm just going to move the number itself, but I'm going to move this uh, 2 down so it's a subscript of potassium. So now I'm going to write K2O, and I'm not going to write the 1. Because we need to make sure that we have our charges balance out. So I have a total of two negative charges 
that means that I have to have a total of two positive charges to balance those out. That's why I have two potassium and one oxygen because the oxygen has a charge of negative two. Here, up here, I didn't write anything because potassium and fluorine, or sorry, fluoride ion, so potassium ion and fluoride, they both had a charge of negative one. So the total charge here, the total charge here has to equal zero. It has to equal zero. So let's take another one. If I have aluminum, we're going to do a little bit more of a difficult one. Actually, I'm going to clear that. So now let's take a look at a little bit more of a difficult one. So if I have aluminum, I'm going to, want to bond that with oxygen. So I have aluminum plus three, and I'm going to add that to oxygen, negative two. What is that going to yield? Well, again, I'm going to do my little cross multiplication. I'm just going to move the number. I'm not going to move the charge. So I'm going to end up with aluminum, 2, O, 3. So let's take a look at how many charges we have here. So 2 times positive 3, if I just do this for practice, that gives me a total charge here of positive 6. And then on the other side, I have 3 times negative 2 gives me a total charge of negative 6. So this then, the total charge here, equals 0. Okay, let's try that again. I'm going to take potassium, or sorry, not potassium, phosphorus, or phosphide, and I'm going to, let's combine that with calcium ion. So we start again, we're going to write our cation first, calcium, positive 2, plus phosphide, negative 3, is going to yield... CA3P2. And again, let's take a look and make sure that our charges balance out. So we have a charge here. Total net here on this side, positive 6. And here we have a charge of negative 3. So this is negative 6. So again, the net charge here uh, comes out to 0. The last thing we need to look at when we... Um, when we balance these or when we make an, an ionic compound is to ensure that we um, include in our answer the lowest common multiple and I'll show you what I mean when we uh, when we list these. So we're going to combine germanium and oxygen. So GE positive 4 plus oxygen negative 2. This is going to yield and again when we do our cross multiplication again all right, we're going to cross these over. We're going to write GE2O4. Now, if I put my charges in here again, positive 4 and negative 2, I end up with uh, positive 8 and negative 8. So I've done this correctly, but I haven't finished yet. What I need to do is put these two numbers here down to the lowest common multiple. So I can reduce this even further. So I'm going to go GeO2. That's how I get down to the lowest common multiple. So balancing ionic charges in compounds is actually very simple. It's just a matter of getting into practice doing them. It's very simple math. The math isn't difficult. Um, it's just a matter of taking a look through your periodic table, having an understanding of the charges of the ions, making sure you understand what they are, where they are. Uh, we'll look at um, ions that have um, that have more than one or multiple charges. We're also going to look at uh, polyatomic ions uh, in our next video as well. So again, practice in, uh, in class doing this. Make sure you ask, for, ask lots of questions, ask for help, ask the people in your class. If you didn't quite understand what I did in the earlier ones, go back, rewind the video, uh, pause it, take notes, and practice. And again, thanks for watching, and we will see you in class.